Good morning to everyone. For this video, we are going to discuss sexual harassment in a work-related education or training environment. This is based on Republic Act 7877, otherwise known as the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995. This law was approved on February 14, 1995 and became effective on March 5, 1995 or 15 days after its complete publication in two newspapers of general circulation. It is more popularly known as the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995. Now, let's go to the meat of the matter. What is sexual harassment in a work-related education or training environment? Section 3 of RA 7877 defines sexual harassment as an act committed by an employer, employee, manager, supervisor, agent of the employer, or any other person who, having authority, influence, or moral ascendancy over another, in a work or training or education environment demands, requests, or otherwise requires any sexual favor from the other, regardless of whether the demand, request, or requirement for submission is accepted by the object of said act. These are the elements of sexual harassment in a work-related training or education environment. First element, that the offender is an employer, or he may be an employee, manager, supervisor, agent of the employer, or any other person. Second element, such offender has authority, influence, or moral ascendancy over another in a work or training or education environment. And third, the offender demands, requests, or otherwise requires any sexual favor from the other regardless of whether such demand, request, or requirement for submission is accepted by the object of said act. Let's discuss each of these elements in the succeeding slides. Let's go back to the first element. That the offender is an employer, employee, manager, supervisor, agent of the employer, or any other person. Practically anybody, male or female, can be an offender in this crime of sexual harassment, provided the second and third elements will likewise exist. Take note that the victim and the perpetrator can be any gender. And the perpetrator does not have to be always an opposite sex. Meaning to say, the offender can be a male and the victim can be a female. Or it can be the other way around. The victim can be a male and the offender can be a female. Or it could be the offender is a male and the victim is also a male. And the offender is a female and the victim can also be a female. Provided, as I said, that the second and third elements will likewise exist, which we will discuss in this second portion of the slide. And what is that second element? That such offender, who may be a male or a female, or practically anyone, has authority, influence, or moral ascendancy over his victim or his or her victim in what kind of environment? In a work? training or education environment. Now, when you say authority or when you say that the offender has authority, the offender here must have the power or the right to give orders or make decisions and enforce obedience. He must be or he or she must be a person having power or control in a particular, typically a political or administrative sphere. Or like, like what I mentioned, he must have the power or control in a work, training, or education environment. For example, 
a manager of a company has the power or right to give orders to his subordinates. Which means that such manager has the authority over his or her subordinate. And when you say influence, the offender has the capacity to have an effect on the character development or behavior of his victim. The offender must have the capacity to affect or change how his or her victim develops, behaves, or thinks. This is very important in the crime of sexual harassment because as I will discuss later in the third element, the offender will either request, demand, or solicit sexual favors from his or her victim. Now, when you say moral ascendancy, this term is commonly used as a synonym for moral high ground, but in law, it can refer to a position of authority that can be abused, usually in cases of sexual coercion, which is, in this particular case, the crime of sexual harassment. When you say in a work or training or education environment, this means that the sexual harassment may take place in the premises of the workplace or office or of the school or training institution. It may also take place in any place where the parties are found as a result of work or education or training responsibilities or relations. Or it may take place at work or education or training related social functions. It may also take place while on official business outside the office or school or training institution or during work or school or training related travel. So this means that the sexual harassment doesn't have to always take place inside the premises of the workplace, for example. Because Sexual harassment may even take place while the offender is communicating with his or her would-be victim during a telephone call or when the offender sends electronic mail or when the offender communicates with his or her victim through the forms of social media communication. Let's go to the third element, that the offender demands, requests, or otherwise requires any sexual favor from the offender regardless of whether such demand, request, or requirement for submission is accepted by the object of said act. Question. Should the demand, request, or requirement be explicit? The answer is no. Demand of sexual favor need not be explicit or expressly stated. While it is true that RA 7877 calls for a demand, request, or requirement of a sexual favor, it is not necessary that such demand, request, or requirement be articulated in a categorical, oral, or written manner. It may be discerned with equal certitude from the acts of the offender as long as the act results in an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment for the offended party. For example, X, manager of Y, constantly holds the waist of the latter every time he passes by her work area. Y could not do anything to stop her manager from his sexual advances because precisely he is her manager and she is afraid that X might get angry if she tries to stop him from touching or holding her every time they meet. Another example, X, a senior high teacher of Y in one of Y's subjects, will not give Y a passing grade unless the latter agrees to have a date with him at Jollibee. Now, 
in this example, while x was merely asking for a date, and it may even be said that there was no demand or request of, for a sexual favor from y, but it can be interpreted as a request or demand of a sexual favor because X here is using his power as a teacher to coerce Y into giving in to his demand for a date. Can you imagine? X will not give Y a passing grade unless Y agrees to have a date with him. This is a classic example of sexual harassment in an education environment which is precisely the evil sought to be avoided by the enactment of Republic Act 7877. When is sexual harassment committed in an employment or work-related environment? In a work-related or employment environment, sexual harassment is committed when Number one, the sexual favor is made as a condition in the hiring or in the employment, re-employment, or continued employment of said individual, or in granting said individual favorable compensation, terms of conditions, promotions, or privileges, or the refusal to grant the sexual favor results in limiting, segregating, or classifying the employee which in any way would discriminate deprive or diminish employment opportunities or otherwise adversely affect said employee. And number two, the above acts would impair the employee's rights or privileges under existing labor laws or number three, the above acts would result in an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment for the employee. Let me give you some examples. Example number one. X, an employee of Y's company, is slated or due for promotion. Y, however, told X he would not promote her unless she gives in to his sexual advances. X refused. Y did not promote her. This is plain and simple sexual harassment because her refusal to grant the sexual favor resulted in depriving her of her employment opportunity. Another example, X, an employee of Y's company, is due for promotion. Y, however, told X he would not promote her unless she gives in to his sexual advances. Since X sorely needed the promotion, she gave in to Y's demand and they had sex. Y promoted her. However, Y wanted more. X, fearing that she would lose her job if she refused, gave in for the second time to Y's demand. Here, even if the demand of sexual favor did not result in the impairment of her employment opportunities as in fact she was promoted, it clearly resulted in an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment for X. Allow me to share to you the case of one Rosalinda C. Cortez, a victim of sexual harassment, whose case reached all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, at the time the sexual harassment took place, there was yet no law on sexual harassment. But this is a classic case or a classic example of sexual harassment because here the Supreme Court even if there was yet no sexual harassment law at that time, sided with Rosalinda Cortez and awarded her damages on account of the sexual harassment she injured from her employer. These are the facts of the case. William Chua, the company's manager, manifested a special liking for Rosalinda, the company nurse. He would oftentimes invite her for a date, which she would often refuse. On many occasions, 
he would make sexual advances, touching her hands, putting his arms around her shoulders, running his fingers on her arms, and telling her she looked beautiful. The special treatment and sexual advances continued during her employment for four years, but she never reciprocated his flirtations, until finally, she noticed that his attitude towards her changed. He made her understand that if she would not give in to his sexual advances, he would cause her termination from the service, and he made good his threat when he started harassing her. She just found out one day that her table, which was equipped with telephone and intercom units and containing her personal belongings, was transferred without her knowledge to a place with neither telephone nor intercom, for which reason an argument ensued when she confronted William Chua, resulting in her being charged with gross disrespect. Rosalinda was eventually dismissed from employment for serious misconduct on account of the alleged gross disrespect she exhibited towards her employer, among other violations. She then filed a complaint for illegal dismissal before the labor arbiter, but the latter ruled that her termination from employment was valid and legal and at the same time dismissing her claim for damages for lack of merit. On appeal, the NLRC reversed the decision of the labor arbiter and found the company guilty of illegal dismissal. The NLRC ordered the company to reinstate Rosalinda to her former position but denied her claim for damages because the NLRC was baffled why it took Rosalinda more than four years to expose William Chua's alleged sexual harassment. Aggrieved, the company filed a petition for certiorari before the Supreme Court. Issue Is Rosalinda entitled to damages? The Supreme Court said yes. According to the Supreme Court, the gravamen of the offense in sexual harassment is not the violation of the employee's sexuality but the abuse of power by the employer. Any employee, male or female, may rightfully cry foul provided the claim is well substantiated. Strictly speaking, according to the Supreme Court, there is no time period within which he or she is expected to complain through the proper channels. Although, as we will know later in the law itself, the prescriptive period is only three years from the time of the commission of the crime. But in this case, according to the Supreme Court, since there was yet no law on sexual harassment, the Supreme Court sided with her and the Supreme Court said that there is no time period within which he or she or within which a victim of sexual harassment is expected to complain through the proper channels. Furthermore, the Supreme Court said that the time to do so may vary depending upon the needs, circumstances, and more importantly, the emotional threshold of the employee. Not many women especially in this country, are made of the stuff that can endure the agony and trauma of a public, even corporate, scandal. Moreover, few persons are privileged indeed to transfer from one employer to another. The dearth of quality employment has become a daily monster that one may not be expected to give up one's employment easily, but to hang on to it by all tolerable means. Perhaps, according to the Supreme Court, to Rosalinda's mind, for as long as she could outwit her employer's ploys, she would continue on her job and consider them as mere occupational hazards. This uneasiness in her place of work thrived in an atmosphere of tolerance for four years, and one could only imagine the prevailing anxiety and resentment, if not bitterness, that beset her all that time. But soon William Chua faced reality 
since he had no place in private respondent's heart, meaning according to the Supreme Court, since the employer found out that he had no place in Rosalinda's heart, so must she have no place in his office. So he provoked her, harassed her, and finally dislodged her. And for finally venting her pent-up anger for years, he found then the perfect reason to terminate her from employment. The Supreme Court further observed that anxiety was gradual in Rosalinda's five-year employment. It began when her plant manager showed an obvious partiality for her, which went out of hand when he started to make it clear that he would terminate her services if she would not give in to his sexual advances. Take note of this. Sexual harassment, according to the Supreme Court, is an imposition of misplaced superiority which is enough to dampen an employee's spirit in her capacity for advancement. It affects her sense of judgment. It changes her life. If for this alone, private respondents should be adequately compensated. Thus, for the anxiety, the seen and unseen hurt that she suffered, the company, William Shua, should also be made to pay her moral damages plus exemplary damages for the oppressive manner with which William Chua effected her dismissal from the service and also to serve as a forewarning to lecherous officers and employers who take undue advantage of their ascendancy over their employees. That was the case of Rosalinda. And as I said, it is a classic example of what sexual harassment is in the workplace. Now, when is sexual harassment committed in an education or training environment? In an education or training environment, sexual harassment is committed, number one, against one who is under the care, custody, or supervision of the offender. Like a coach having supervision over his players. Sexual harassment is also committed against one whose education, training, apprenticeship, or tutorship is entrusted to the offender, like a teacher having the trust and confidence of his students. Number three, sexual harassment is committed when the sexual favor is made a condition to the giving of a passing grade or the granting of honors and scholarships or the payment of a stipend, allowance, or other benefits, privileges, or consideration. Or number four, when the sexual advances result in an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment for the student, trainee, or apprentice. Question. Can a person who does not have authority, influence, or moral ascendancy over another in a work or training or education environment still be held liable under RA 7877-7877? Or can a person who did not directly demand, request, or otherwise require any sexual favor still be held liable under the said law? The answer is yes. Any person who directs or induces another to commit any act of sexual harassment or who cooperates in the commission thereof by another without which it would not have been committed shall also be held liable under this act. So, this is, by analogy, an example of a principal by inducement who is equally liable with the principal by direct participation. And this is also akin to what we call in criminal law, particularly in the Revised Penal Code, 
to a principal by indispensable cooperation because his cooperation is so essential that the crime would not have been committed without his cooperation or assistance. Do lewd comments per se constitute sexual harassment? Not necessarily. However, where these lewd comments create an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment for the aggrieved person, then such act may be complained of as sexual harassment by the aggrieved party. Of course, to constitute sexual harassment, such lewd comments must be uttered or made by the offender who has the authority, influence, or moral ascendancy over another in a work or training or education environment, and that the same should be akin to a request for a sexual favor from the would-be victim. What are the forms of sexual harassment? There are three. The first form is the so-called physical sexual harassment. Physical sexual harassment includes unwelcome, unwanted physical contact, including touching, tickling, pinching, patting, brushing up against, hugging, cornering, kissing, and fondling, and forced sexual intercourse or assault. But I would venture to add you know, that if there is forced sexual intercourse, it will not only result in sexual harassment, but the offender should also be held liable for rape because this is already forced sexual intercourse. The other form of sexual harassment is the so-called verbal sexual harassment. This includes innuendos, suggestive comments, jokes of a sexual nature, sexual propositions, lewd remarks and threats, or requests for any type of sexual favor. This includes repeated and welcome requests for dates, commenting about anything sexual to someone who has made it clear that he or she does not appreciate that behavior, or asking personal sexual questions. The third form of sexual harassment is the so-called non-verbal sexual harassment. This includes the distribution, display, or discussion of any written or graphic material, including calendars, posters, and cartoons that are sexually suggestive or show hostility toward an individual or group because of sex, giving favors like giving more attention, dropping cases, admission and readmission, in exchange for sexual favors, suggestive or insulting sounds, leering, staring, whistling, obscene gestures, content in letters and notes, facsimiles, emails, photos, text messages, tweets, and internet postings, or other form of communication that is sexual and offensive in nature. Now, what is the duty of the employer or head of office in a work-related education or training environment in order to prevent or deter the commission of acts of sexual harassment? The employer or the head of office in such work-related education or training environment must promulgate appropriate rules and regulations in consultation with and jointly approved by the employees or students or trainees through their duly designated representatives prescribing the procedure for the investigation of sexual harassment cases and the administrative sanctions therefore. The said rules and regulations issued shall include among others guidelines on proper decorum in the workplace and educational or training institutions. So every company now every school or trading institution is required to promulgate such rules and regulations to prevent the commission of acts of sexual harassment. Another duty is to create a committee on decorum and investigation of cases on sexual harassment. 
This committee shall conduct meetings, as the case may be, with officers and employees, teachers, instructors, professors, coaches, trainers, and students or trainees to increase understanding and prevent incidents of sexual harassment. It shall also conduct the investigation of, of alleged cases constituting sexual harassment. In the case of a work-related environment, the committee on decorum shall be composed of at least one representative each from the management, the union if any, the employees from the supervisory rank, and from the rank and file employees. Now, in the case of the educational or training institutions, the committee on decorum shall be composed of at least one representative from the administration, the trainers, instructors, professors, or coaches, and students, or trainees, as the case may be. Now, the employer or head of office, educational or training institution shall disseminate or post a copy of this act referring to RA 7877 for the information of all concerned. What then are the legal remedies against sexual harassment? The offended party may opt to file an administrative action against the offender pursuant to Section 4. What do I mean by administrative action? Simply put, the offended party may file an administrative case against the offender depending on where the offender is employed. So, if the offender is employed in a company, let's say he is a manager of that company, then that is where the offended party can file an administrative case against him or her. Or if the offender is a teacher in a school, then that is the place where the offended party should file an administrative case. Or if the offender is a coach in a training institution, then that is the place where the offended party should file an administrative action against the erring party. Now, take note that administrative sanctions imposed by the company or by the school or by the training institution shall not be a bar to prosecution in the proper courts for unlawful acts of sexual harassment. Because the offended party, even if he or she had already filed an administrative case against the offender, the offended party can still file an independent action for damages against the offender pursuant to Section 6 of RA 7877. This is a civil case for damages. Regardless of whether a criminal case for sexual harassment or an administrative case for sexual harassment had already been filed. Precisely why it's called independent action. Now, under Section 5, the employer or head of office of the company or educational or training institution will be solidarily liable with the offender arising from the acts of sexual harassment committed in the employment, education, or training environment if the employer or head of office of the educational or training institution is informed of such acts by the offended party and no immediate action is taken. And of course, the offended party can file a criminal action for sexual harassment under Section 7. The imposable penalty if the offender is found guilty is imprisonment of not less than one month nor more than six months or a fine of not less than 10,000 nor more than 20,000 pesos or both such fine and imprisonment at the discretion of the court. What about the prescriptive period for actions arising from acts of sexual harassment? According to the law, the prescriptive period is three years. Take note, however, that the law does not 
expressly state from what time should the three-year prescriptive period be recorded. Is it three years from the alleged commission of the acts of sexual harassment or three years from the time the offended party or victim is able to file an action because he or she was prevented from doing so by the offender? That is a question that should be answered by legislation because, as I said, there is no or it is not expressly stated in the law from what time should the three-year prescriptive period be reckoned. 